Julianne Woodward uh, is an oculofacial plastic surgeon ophthalmologist. She is the chief of oculofacial surgery at Duke University. She is board certified in ophthalmology. She had her fellowship uh, in oculofacial and reconstructive surgery and laser facial aesthetic surgery at Cimarron Eye Clinic ba Baker Laser Center in Oklahoma. She got, did her residency in ophthalmology at the University of Texas Medical Branch in 1997. And she got her MD at University of Texas Medical School in 1993. Uh, a little bit more about Dr. Woodward. Um, as the Chief of Oculofacial Surgery at Duke, uh, Dr. Woodward specializes in cosmetic and reconstructive surgery of the eyelids and orbit, as well as the cosmetic laser surgery of the skin. She has written over 70 peer-reviewed journal articles on her work with cosmetic lasers, injectable fillers, neuromodulators, and benign essential blepharospasm. She speaks frequently at both national and international meetings. She also serves on the editorial board of three aesthetic journals and was the first female oculofacial surgeon to be featured on the cover of the Plastic Surgery Practice magazine. She also serves on the BEBRF Medical Board of Advisors. In addition, she is a passionate artist and works with a variety of mediums. She believes that her work as a cosmetic surgeon is an extension of her great love of art. And she showed us some of her art last night and it was really great. So now I would like for you to welcome Dr. Julie Woodward. All right, thank you, Charlene. Hello everyone in BEBRF virtual land. I'm going to share my screen. So it's my honor to speak to you today. I'm really excited to share some of our research and thoughts about surgical therapies for benign essential blepharospasm. And I have a few disclosures below for some of the companies I work with. And interesting to this group, even though it's mostly on the aesthetic side, I have some kind of relationship with every single company that makes the neuromodulators, neurotoxins. So I can kind of, I wear two hats where I get to work with these things on the cosmetic side and the functional side. So I'd be happy to answer any questions about those. So I have to say a huge thank you to my patients over the years. I have been at Duke for about 22 years and I followed blepharospasm patients that entire time. So uh, slowly over the course of my career, I decided to start collecting little anecdotal uh, patients telling their story about their blepharospasm. And it's really nice to see the evolution of how they've done with different therapies. And they've signed consent forms to release their videos so you could see their experiences with the myectomy surgery. So it'll give you a little bit better feeling than just reading a journal article or talking to me. So I have to say that the talk is uh, largely anecdotal. And I do have one surgical video. If you feel like you're a little bit squeamish, I'll warn you when that one is coming up. It shows a myectomy that's done with laser though. I always use the laser and not a cold steel knife. So it's not nearly as uh, scary as, as some bloody videos you might have seen in the past. So just to give a review about benign essential blepharospasm, we know that it's a focal cranial dystonia bilateral increased blink rate with forceful involuntary contractions. About 8% are classified as apraxia, meaning you just can't open your eyes. The etiology is multifactorial with some genetic predisposition, fifth to seventh decades, largely female, often type A personalities. The majority of patients have dry eyes. One study showed 55, I think it's probably higher than that. And it can be relieved by a sensory tick, which is some type of motion that you do elsewhere in your body or your face that can break the spasms, including speaking loudly, a loud tone of voice. We know that it has a natural history that can usually be progressive, although you, I will show you some patients that spontaneously got better. Uh, it has an initial presentation, which is often delayed in diagnosis. Unfortunately, people can bounce around to eight different doctors before they figure out what's going on. And over time, you know, it becomes more forceful and blinking and is involuntary. And some patients are actually functionally blind. There was Bruegel syndrome and Bruegel was the artist who painted the first image of patients with the spasms. Sometimes people didn't know what this was. And as you know, it can be socially disabled. So he first expressed that. And then Mays described the spasms going into the lower face, and then the disease was described further by Henderson, and then Callahan 
develop the nerectomy, which is where certain nerves are cut out that go to the eyes. And then in the 80s, we had things come about like Maddie Lou developed the BEBRF, Anderson developed the full myectomy, and Dr. Alan Scott created oculinum, which he invented to line up the eyes for strabismus. It meant line up the eyes, ocu, line them up. So uh, this is me with him years ago. It was a real pleasure to meet this gentleman. The pathophysiology, as we know, is very confusing. It has some genetic background and there's probably some type of environmental trigger. It is not well elucidated. We know that 27% of people have a first degree relative. And if you ask further, many of my patients will say, oh, my uncle had Parkinson's disease or some other kind of movement disorder. So there's probably even more genetics than uh, we've been able to nail down. There's reduced CNS, meaning your central nervous system inhibition. The brain can be more plastic with decreased dopamine. And there's a neuropsych component to it. So we know it's not fully elucidated, and there's this increased plasticity of the brain, there's less dopamine, there's an enlarged putamen on functional MRI scans. And then there's that neuropsych component where sometimes the more you think about it, the worse it can get, which also can happen with tinnitus, which is ringing in the ears, irritable bowel syndrome, and also restless leg. They can make an animal model out of this by destroying the dopamine containing cells, which can cause hyper excitability in rats that can be used to study. Treatments, you name it, it's been done. So for sensory treatments, they've tried everything. Of course, we always treat dry eyes with tears, plugs. We've tried the FL41 rose tinted glasses help some patients. Dilating drops, biofeedback, relaxation, acupuncture can help. Meditation and superior cervical ganglion block with lidocaine can break it for a short period of time. And then there's drugs, which are central control. You all have tried probably clonopin and Ativan. Those are mainstays. They've tried antipsychotics, lithium. I'm going to talk a little bit about amphetamine because those are some of the studies we did at Duke. They tried SSRIs and other medicines. Nothing ever cures it. It all helps a little bit. So at Duke, Years ago, we did this study in 2010 that we published because some of our patients were telling us that, that Ritalin helped them. They were coming and taking other family members Ritalin. And so we tested, uh, it was a pilot program where we gave the patients their methylphenidate and then videoed them at the same time they were connected to an EMG machine simultaneously to observe how the uh, EMG machine decreased the voltage of the spasms around their eyes. And I'm gonna share with you a few of the patients that were in that study. So here's a patient who is pre-taking the methylphenidate. You can see his eyes are tense. He's had a myectomy. He's got spasms ranging from 100 to 200 in his voltage. And then 30 minutes after the medicine was given, because it takes about 30 minutes to kick in, you can see his eyes are more open. And as the voltage is going across, you can see it greatly dropped from around 150 or so to around 30, 40. So it, seemed, it doesn't work in all patients, but most of my colleagues that also use this treatment for their patients, we all kind of agree. It seems to help in about 70, maybe 80% of patients. And here's another patient. He's struggling. He's got his chin up with a little ptosis. And you can see his voltage is around 130, 140. 30 minutes after taking the medication, he's able to open his eyes better and the voltage has dropped almost a hundred points. And here's another patient. His voltage is running about 90 or so, struggling. And you can see it doesn't cure the problem, but you can see here in his after, the voltage will drop by about 70, 80 points. You can see it drops down to about 30 or 40. So it seems to work in, like I said, most patients. I don't encourage everybody to take this medication. It's not good if, you're, if you have a heart condition. It is really, uh, we encourage it for when the botulinum toxin starts to wear off. And that little two to three week period when you're trying to make it to the next treatment, that's the best time to use this medication. Moving along. So our conclusions were, we think that this works by increasing the available dopamine in the brain. We also do not encourage it if the patients have Parkinson's disease and are being treated by the neurologist with other medications. I prefer that the neurologist control. It's good to have just one person controlling medications as opposed to multiple doctors. So we always try to coordinate this appropriately. 
Then we have treatments that are central, such as the deep brain stimulation and transmagnetic stimulation. Most of the neurologists are working on these. They seem to help mostly in patients with Parkinson's disease from what I've seen. Um, so everything, again, helps a little bit in the right, right patient. And then there were the surgical treatments, which started with the neurectomy, which is basically creating a seventh nerve palsy so that the eyelids can't blink. And this helps with some patients as well. And then we have the motor treatments, which are basically anything that weakens the muscles. You can do this chemically or you can do it surgically. The chemomyectomies are your botulinum toxin, and that's your mainstay of treatment. Although most insurance companies and Medicare prefer you to try an oral medication first and prove that it is not doing enough for you before you can go to a treatment of Botox or, or botulinum toxin. So there's five available right now. There's ONA, INCO, and those are the ones that are FDA approved that Medicare will pay for. And then there's the non-FDA approved ones, which are ABO, PRABO, which is only cosmetic, and then Daxi, which hasn't been approved at all by the FDA yet, but it is touted to be a longer lasting toxin up to six months. I visited their headquarters a couple of months ago, and unfortunately, they are not interested in pursuing a functional indication for blepharospasm. They're hoping that sympathetic insurance companies may pay for it anyway, but the reason is it's gotten very, very difficult to do a clinical trial with any type of medication around the eyes because of extensive FDA requirements. So uh, this is an area where the BEBRF uh, may be able to help uh, push this through because I would really like to see this available to our patients. Then we're, there's surgical options to decrease the muscles around the eye. So that's the limited myectomy, which is what I usually like to perform. I don't like to do it too extensively. I like to keep it localized to the eyelids. And then there's an extensive myectomy where you can take out muscles around the eyebrows and in the center of the forehead as well. And then sometimes we tighten the tendon in the eyelid so you can fight the spasms better by opening the eyelids wider. And I'll show you some examples of these patients. So the, this is the removal of the protractor muscles around the eyes to weaken the blink reflex and perhaps need less botulinum toxin. But I always warn my patients that the injections might be a little more painful after the operation due to scar tissue. So this was first described in 1951 and then it was expanded. Rick Anderson did the more full myectomy in 1981 where he also lifted the brow. And we always tell our patients about risk with this operation. The main risk is it's harder to close your eyes. So you can have worsening of your dry eye due to exposure keratopathy. You could have some scarring, which could also make your toxin injections a little bit more sensitive. And of course you could have asymmetry of your eyelids. That's more due to the tendon repair usually. And I had one patient last year who had a refractive error, meaning a change in her glasses. And it took us a while to, to sort that out and get her eyelids even. As a whole, when I look back at my patient population, I've maybe done about 50 myectomies over the years, not as much as some physicians that have done well over hundred, uh, but I'd say only maybe one or two patients. I, I haven't had anybody that regretted the operation ever. I've had a couple of people say it didn't help. So as a whole, it's a very successful operation that most people are happy they've had done. Just to go over the anatomy, what we do is we remove part of the orbicularis muscle. And here you can see Glenn Jelks who made the, the quintessential anatomy diagrams. He's a plastic surgeon in New York and this is his wife who's an ophthalmologist. And you can see the labels I put on where it says orbicularis. The orbicularis muscle is a sphincter that goes in a big circle all around the eyelids, upper to lower, it's a giant circle. And that's the muscle right beneath the skin we lift the skin and remove the, as much of this muscle as we can safely, and it just softens the blink reflex. It does not get rid of the neurological impulse to tell the muscle to try to blink. So the nerves are still going on. We do take out some of the nerves laterally, but not the nerves in the sides of the face, because that nerve comes from in front of the ear and then rides up to the eyelids where it can, tells you to blink. So we're not removing the nerve around here. That would be a neurectomy. We're removing the, the nerves local in the muscle around the eyelids. It's important to know that tear flow has a natural movement across the eye where it's made in the lacrimal gland. The majority of the tears are made in where number one is, that's the lacrimal gland. And then they flow across the cornea where you see the number two to lubricate your eye. And then it drains down your tear duct into your sinus. So weakening the blink reflex will could potentially disturb the tear flow in some patients. So it's important to know you may have to use more lubrication in your eyes if you have this operation. So here we get to the fun part. 
this is where I just let the talk go anecdotal and let some of my patients explain to you their experiences. I'll show some patients at one week out, seven months out, four years, seven years, and I have a patient coming up 12 years out from the myectomy. So here's patient number one. For the first hour and a half to two hours in the morning, there's no problem with my eye. Uh, out about, after about two hours, dryness begins, even though I put tears in my eyes constantly throughout the day. This droopy eye, it starts shutting if I'm on the golf course and in wind and sun, I have a devil of a time. I can't see the putt, I can't anything, and by mid-afternoon, the left eye is totally shut on me and remains such until the next morning. And that will just about do it. And my life is in ruins right now, and Dr. Woodward is going to help me and get it back together. So that's her pre. Now this is the part, if you have a queasy stomach, maybe turn off because I'm going to show a short surgical video on how we do the procedure with the laser. It's a knife of light. So I'm going to scroll through some of this. This is inserting the eyelid protector. So this is so no laser can damage the eye and we make incisions with our knife of light. They're very precise. Coagula is most bleeding, so it's not a bloody operation. I actually years ago had one neurologist that was pulling my patients off of the schedule because he thought it was a very gory, bloody operation. But when, I, when we had a conference and I showed this video, he was so excited about it, he started sending me patients for years and years. Um, so I'm gonna speed it up a little bit. So we're moving skin and muscle here. And the smoke evacuator is just kind of taking up some of the laser plume. That's what that yellow device is. And then here we're stripping out this little strip of muscle right on the top part of the eyelid. Elegant operation. And that's releasing the tendon so we can tighten it. And then I'm going to scoot it along a little bit to show how we take out the muscles around the side of the eyes that are causing so much to here. We're pulling up the orbicularis muscle and we're going to laser that out. And then taking out. Now here we're ablating a little bit more muscle. And then we go in to take out some of the muscles towards the nose and a little bit more closer to the brows. So I'm just gonna go ahead and cut this off so um, we can get on with the talk. So here's this exact same patient about a week after. So how has the surgery helped you? How has it? Yes. Oh, it's restored my life. I will be able to drive after dark again, I think. I'm pretty sure I haven't driven in a week and uh, my eyes are not closing on me. I'm not bouncing off the walls at home or anywhere else. And I'm gonna be able to play golf much better because it's hard to play when the, your eyes shut on you on the backswing and you whiff the ball. Um, oh, it's just, it's wonderful. Close your eyes. Okay, good, close all the way, a little tight. Good. Wanna say something else? Go ahead, open. So you feel that your quality of life is improved just this week? My quality of life is improved 100%. There you go. Dr. Woodward is a dear. She has literally saved my life. Has <laughs> given it back to me. I can be able to go to Europe anymore. I can go walk out in the woods, which I love to do. I can do anything. And here for for three whole years, I've not been able to do anything but limited activities. Words can't express my feelings for you and for this procedure and let her rip. Let's roll. And I did not have to pay her to say that. So you here's had another your one. Back to me about seven or eight months ago. And what percentage would you say your quality of life has improved? 90%. Great. What kind of activities can you do better now? I can read better. I can, you know, kind of drive, you know, better. And I can 
that's about most of the thing I do. Uh, you know, do the thing like cook and see how to do cook cook better. Like that, like that. And the zoom in is helping your eyes as well. The Botox. Yeah, the similar zoom in Botox are very similar. Yes. 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 And how long does it last usually? Probably about close to two months. Great. And then you're able to control it with with the with the Ritalin. Yeah, and that kind of gets you through those last couple of weeks. Yeah, just yes. Excellent. So there you have an example. You could see the patient before really struggling in the upper left corner. You can see her one week after and you can see her dramatic improvement uh, at seven months. She's still still doing well. And actually, she she actually thinks she's doing well enough. She hasn't come back for any injections for years. And uh, the, the other patient I showed you, she actually never needed any toxin again. I've had three patients in all of my career that have their spasms just went away. So I, I hate to say there's no hope that there's a chance this might go away. It's rare, but I've seen three patients um, and I'll show you those as well. So here comes the next one. There we go. Four years post -tomatic. So how long ago was your myectomy operation? It's been three years. And how did the myectomy operation improve your quality of life? hundred percent. A hundred percent back at that time. Yes. Or yeah. I was um, taping my eyelids up with band-aids and still receiving Botox injections every three months and been doing that for over two years with a uh, little help. I think I was, it was four years. Yeah, <laughs> it might have been, yeah. And then the myectomy operation, at first you thought it was about 100% improvement of your quality of life, oh, right? Yeah, absolutely. And now, um, how would you compare your life now to before the myectomy? Before that myectomy? Mm -hmm. It's, we're probably at least 50%, you know, because I still struggle, you know, with light and stress mm -hmm. and, um, you know, uh, my morning routine. Um, probably have to hold the eyelid open to brush my teeth or to shave. And you're um, still getting your injections. And since then, you've also developed a neck tremor, correct? Yes, yes. Um, cervical tremors yeah. is what I was diagnosed Are you with. able to drive now? I do drive, yeah. Before um, the myectomy, could you drive? Uh, didn't feel safe driving. Yeah, but I was taping my eyes open. So if I had to do some driving, I would. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's not short distances, you know, like, um, it's two miles to my kids' school. So I could go pick them up and grocery stores like two miles, you know. Any, any, um, advice you could give to patients who are interested in having a myectomy? Uh, give it a shot. Uh, it helped me uh, a lot. It's a blessing. Was the healing difficult? Were you bruised? Just a little bit, but, uh, you know, uh, it is well worth it. I mean, there was, I don't know, I think I have a high threshold for pain, uh, but I had no problems with it at all. <clears throat> None. I mean, I heal very good. Very good. So he is what I think of as a very typical response where it's great at first. A lot of people say, oh, it's 100% better. And they think they can go without their injections for five or so months. And then eventually some of the spasms come back and they eventually get back to wanting regular injections, but they still say that it's better than it was before the surgery. So it's not a cure. You're still going to need those other treatments. It's just that it makes an improvement. So here's another patient. How did a myectomy up. surgery help your eyes? Wait a minute. I'm not sure. When we did your eyelid surgery, we did oh, oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, that helped tremendously. Yes, because I couldn't keep my eyes open at all. I'd take a, two steps and my eyes would close completely, and I'd have to take my thumbs and pull my eyes open to be able to see and you know? all. And I went like that probably three months or more before I've had the surgery, but it's been wonderful ever since. You know, good. You know? And uh, how was the recovery from that? Oh, it was, it was fine. It, I didn't have no problem at all. No. Good. And how long has it been now since we did It's probably been like seven years. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. I'm thinking it's seven years. And you still think you're better off today than you were before the surgery? Oh, yes. Most, much better. Yes. Good. And you still get your injections, right? Right. That every three months. Uh-huh. Uh -huh.
And here's one where uh, a very dear couple that I've been taking care of the husband for a long time. And I just love uh, hearing his wife's uh, impression of how this helped. How many years ago was your myectomy surgery? Yeah, she I have no idea. 2012, almost about 10 years ago. And where do you think you'd be now if you hadn't had that surgery? <laughs> what was it you said he'd be blind? I think he would be blind. I think he would not be able to drive. I think he would have his eyes so tightly closed he wouldn't really be able to see at all. And then you also had the deep brain stimulation? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that did that help as well? Uh, yes. It's great. So you're able to drive with your Botox still every, or you're, you have Zeeman and yes. we alternate with Dysport, correct? Right. And which one usually works better? Dysport. Yeah, and you've been doing that for how many years? Uh, Okay. Oh. And how did you think your husband recovered from the myectomy surgery? It was amazingly quickly. He didn't have any pain. Uh, he was able to go home the next day. We lived four hours away. He probably could have gone home the same day if we hadn't been so far away. And he, he virtually had no side effects from the surgery at all. And much bruising? Not any hardly any bruising and you can't even see where it was done yeah this is all done with laser yes yes and you're the wife so you would know i know i was the, <laughs> the caretaker so those are spasm patients and then we have our patients with apraxia where we they're more difficult to treat as you all know and sometimes we have to put in what's called frontalis slings it's kind of a, almost a clear rubber band that goes from the eyelid to the eyebrow. So the patients use their eyebrows to pull up their lids. Um, these have their own set of risks of infection and extrusion and things like that. And so here's a patient uh, who had that done. How long have you had blepharospasm? Uh, probably three or four years. So not too long. And how did the surgery improve your quality of life? Uh, it uh, improved it quite a bit because I couldn't open my eyes before and I could now. And uh, that makes a difference <laughs> in how I can see and, and get around. And what kind of activities <clears throat> have you been able to do better? Uh, walk down the hall and <laughs> go to the bathroom and things like that. That's key. And yeah. open your eyes really wide. And you feel like the frontalis slings uh, uh, enable your eyes to open wider? Yes. How mm -hmm. long can you hold them open? Uh, sometimes for half an hour or so. Uh, but uh, it varies some from day to day. Good. And you don't take any medications or do any injections anymore, correct? No. I just take some carbidopa, levodopa. And then I don't want you to think every patient needs a myectomy. There's a lot of patients I treat that I don't think are candidates for myectomy. If you're doing well on your you know, injections and your oral medications, and you don't have a lot of ptosis and dermatoclasis, I don't think you're really a candidate for surgery. So this is just a patient I've been treating for almost 22 years, uh, does really well with the therapies we have her on. And so this is her story. And how many years have you had blood first spasm? Well, let's see. Um, well, you've been treating me for about 21 years and it was, probably a few years before that, before I was ever diagnosed. Right, and your spasm has been fairly well controlled with uh, the injections every three months this about whole time? Every, yeah, about three, four months. Yeah, and you only get about 70 units of Botox, correct? Mm -hmm, that's what I've always got. And you've never needed surgery, right? No. Awesome. So. Not a... 
So there's several publications about this surgery and uh, Anderson that I mentioned really pioneered the full myectomy. And uh, going on down the line, uh, you have Mike Yen in 2003, who did a review of over 100 cases, I believe. And he's spoken to you about this before. He's an excellent, excellent speaker. And uh, he's a, a, a fellow trained under Anderson. And then we have uh, Dan Joshow in uh, 2007. And he had noted that 88% of his patients had apraxia. And the disability scale improved from 14 Point one one to down to 5.2. So that may be kind of a general um, amount of improvement that someone may see on a, a, a validated disability scale from having the procedure. One thing that's tough for us as physicians is that there's no reimbursement for it. So it's, you know, it used to pay back in the 70s and then the, the prices got decreased down. So I've gotten to the point where I just do it for free. Uh, we, we pretty much pick candidates that we can get on for the basic, uh, basis of their dermatocolysis and their ptosis. We can bill for those uh, as a standard eyelid lift. Um, we've argued, I've spent more time on the phone arguing with insurance companies than I spent doing the surgery. So uh, I don't know if the BEBRF can, can help uh, uh, negotiate that with Medicare, uh, but that, that's uh, just how it goes. Um, so I always like to say there, there's always hope. Uh, this is a patient who... Uh, was so severely blinded with a severe apraxia that he had had a walking stick just to get around for two years, hadn't been able to go fishing for two years because the spasms were so severe. He had a myectomy and frontalis slings and still needed injections for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden, I cannot explain why, he's one of the lucky ones where spasms just went away. And it's been about four years. I have no idea why some people can just uh, have them spontaneously go away. So here's his story. You've had a myectomy and Botox treatments in the past and say what you want to say. Well, from where I started from to where I am now, it's truly amazing. Um, I never thought that I'd ever be able to see the way I'm seeing today. I ever, I ever and thank to you. Yeah, and his frontalis slings are still in place. It's been, you know, probably about five years since we did that at least, if not longer. And like I said, I, I can't explain it. And his spasms may come back with a certain stressor. Like the next patient that I'm uh, going to show you, uh, this patient had a myectomy back in her 30s and uh, spontaneously spasms went away for nine years and then a stressful incident triggered them to come back, but at least she had nine years of freedom from it. Tell me right now how blood for spasm has been affecting your life. Um, right now, I feel like I've gone downhill. So I feel like it has pretty much, it's destroying my life, especially with my young age. And I feel like I can't go out and live my life the way I should be at this age. So what percentage do you feel you have improved since your myectomy? I feel I've done about an 80% improvement. Um, I don't have the uncontrollable blinking like I did. Um, I don't have the urge to blink. You know, I feel like my eyes are just opened up. I can, you know, I see clear and I look in the mirror. I just look bright eyed and it just, I just don't look down all the time. And I just, it just, I feel better. I feel a lot better. And I'm very glad I had the surgery and I feel like I had a really good outcome. And how many days ago was your surgery? I had it last Tuesday. So it was about a week and one day ago. Right. And was it very painful postoperatively? No, it was not. Um, I did have some swelling underneath, you know, underneath the eyes, but um, the pain was, I think I took one of the pain medicines that I was prescribed that day, but um, pain was very, very, I would say it was probably at one or two. And it was probably, when I hit that one or two, it was probably first thing in the morning. And I just took some Tylenol and out. that was it. It was very, very, very easy surgery to get through. I was very impressed. Thanks. So your myectomy was about 12 years ago in 2009. How did that help you? And how long were you able to go without any treatments for your blepharospasm after the myectomy? Um, it was amazing because I was able to control the blinking and facial spasms, which I was unable to do before. And I had one hiccup where I got a cortisone shot and it brought back the spasms. But once that wore out, I've since had any problems as long as I take my meds regularly. And how 
uh, long did you go until you had that episode? That was about three years ago. So that she was went. nine years. So you, after my estimate, you went for about nine years without any any problems whatsoever. So that's the end of my talk. I want to thank you so much for listening and thank you to the BEBRF uh, for setting this up and doing everything they do uh, to help improve your quality of life and promote public awareness with the support groups that you have. And if anybody has any questions that you think of later, feel free to reach me through a direct message on Instagram. That's my handle at Dr. Julie Woodward. And uh, again, I'll turn it back over to Charlene and happy to answer some questions. Thank you. Um, let me just see. I'm pulling up the questions here. I had one that came in in advance. And, and this uh, woman asked, I had a frontalis sling 14 months ago. Can the cord cause eyelid discomfort as my eyelids are in a constant state of irritation slash discomfort? Yeah, it, it's hard to say why it, it, you have discomfort. You need to make sure it's not extruded. And, you know, it could be that your eyes are having some discomfort because you can't close them all the way. Um, it's possible that this that you just don't agree with the material that it's made of. You know, I, I mean, it's possible, you know, you just have to have it removed if you can't tolerate it. Okay. Uh, let me see. Um, I had an extensive pretarsal and preceptal obicularis myectomy in 2011. I'd previously undergone blepharoplasty and a conservative pretarsal myectomy in 2009 due to developing res resistance to uh, Botox after five years of successful treatment. My question is, is it possible for muscle to regrow as squeezing spasms have returned over the last few months? together with increased involuntary blinking. Now, like I said, it, the muscles really don't regrow. We know nerves can regenerate. So if you cut the nerve or ablate the nerve, it can reconnect and re-sprout new nerve endings, but the muscle really can't grow back. So I think in your situation, the problem is more just a, a progression of the condition itself, which like I showed you in the videos, people have this great improvement for the first few months and think, oh, I'm not gonna need toxin anymore. And the injections are five or six months apart. And then they come back to four months apart and then they're back at every three months apart just because the spasms get severe and kind of overpower part of it. But most people say that they're still better than never having had the surgery before. Okay. Um, can you discuss dosage of Ritalin, please? So we prefer to give baby doses. I give only 10 milligrams. I prefer the short acting. They have long acting and short acting. I think patients like the short acting because it lasts about four hours and you can kind of control when you want it to work. So I usually say, use it if you're gonna drive. That's the best time to use it. And a 10 milligram pill is about what you would give a first grader. And I don't like to call them stimulants. I don't think it's fair to call them stimulants. They're not stimulants, they're focusing agents. It's like, if you drink a cup of coffee, it helps you focus so you can study. So these are, they really help you focus and uh, eliminate some of the extraneous factors that are causing you to spasm. But basically the dose is small, what you would give a, a kindergarten or a first grader. And uh, I don't like the long acting because it's probably gonna release more than you need throughout the day. It's really meant to help focus for certain activities, not to be just something that you use as a mainstay to treat you all day long. Okay. Um, do you ever, I guess, have, have further surgery after the limited myectomy? I had one in 2012 and it did well for years, but it seems now my eyes are less open and Botox is not as effective. So in that case, you probably need to be evaluated to see if there's anything else that can help like a ptosis repair. Perhaps, you know, your levator tendons are becoming more loose and the eyelids are just plain lower and you may be able to lift them, tighten up the tendons and see if that helps you fight the spasm better and improve your visual field. Okay. Um, I had someone, I just saw it flash across the screen. Remember to put your, if you want to ask Dr. Woodward a question, put it in the Q&A uh, icon. But I saw one kind of sliding into chat that I think uh, would be good. Is, is it true that sometimes your eyes don't close as well when you sleep after a myectomy? This can be very true because, you know, you're losing the muscle tone. And that's why I said at the very beginning under the section with risks for myectomy, yeah, it can make your eyes more dry. It can make it harder to close your eyes. I'm actually amazed with all the patients I've seen. And I've, I inherited a lot of patients 
when I came to Duke that had had myectomies before and they were pretty aggressive myectomies, patients that really have big uh, lag up thalamus and can't close their eyes all the way. And I checked their eyes in the slit lamp and some of the people that have pretty large gaps and being able to close their eye, I'm surprised that they don't complain of more dryness than they do. So it's really important to bump up the lubrication during the day and at night after you have a myectomy. Is there an age at which someone becomes too old to have the, the myectomy? I don't think so. And, and you know, it's some, some of the improvement is just from the blepharoplasty and the ptosis repair. So you need to be evaluated for all, all of those things. But no, I think almost any age can benefit from a, a the procedure. Okay. Um, let me see. What does this say? Uh, I have been getting Botox, which helps slow my blinking, except in bright light. But after almost every injection, one of my eyes will be closed for weeks until I can use enough I don't know how to say this, iapidine, iapidine, to, okay, to reopen the eye. Is there any way to avoid the needing to pry one of the eyes open after Botox? So we published a paper in plastic and reconstructive surgery a while ago where we figured that the, the injection that's most likely to cause ptosis is the one right above the eyebrow, right here, above the supraorbital nerve, the notch for the supraorbital nerve. So if you put your thumb kind of right here, don't know if you can see it, there's a nerve bundle, there's a nerve and a artery and a vein that run through that notch and then up the forehead. And that nerve goes to the back of the eye towards the brain and it lays right on top, it just lays right on top of the muscle, the levator muscle that opens your eyelid. And it has a sheath around that nerve. And if you get toxin way above the brow on that sheath and it catches on that sheath, and especially if you bleed a little bit and then someone puts pressure on the bleeding, that toxin can slide along the nerve sheath and be deposited across the entire levator muscle. And that's what causes the ptosis. So usually it's patients with thin foreheads that get ptosis with perhaps a little bit too large of a bolus so I try to really lift the brow up and protect the orbit as I do the injection. And I try to do multiple smaller injections across the brow instead of less larger boluses across the brow. And maybe your injector could do it with a technique that would minimize your chance of atosis. Okay. Would myectomy be suitable post DBS Parkinson's? Absolutely. If, if the DBS isn't, isn't helping. And um, I mean, most people get a little bit of relief from that, especially if they have the Parkinson's, um, but you need to have your eyelids evaluated for sure to see if you're a candidate. Okay. The, this, this person also states that wants to know if you could do a Zoom consultation with the UK. I will tell you Fine. this though, uh, on March 4th, just, we have more questions, but since that showed up right in this queue, um, we are having an all UK uh, support group meeting. So you can contact me for information about that. Um, okay. How do you know if you are a good candidate for a myectomy? Um, I have blepharospasm for four years. It seems like Botox stops working after about one and a half months. Yeah, I never jump to a myectomy. I always start with medications, give patients a trial that. Then I always say, we need to get to know each other before your candidate for a myectomy would be. So I have them do injections for a while. And then, you know, we try it different ways with the injections. And once I sense that they're not really uh, all that the patient needs, and I think that they might be a good surgical candidate, then we'll move on to the myectomy. So sometimes I, I like to get to know people for about six months or so. Um, you know, because you don't want to jump into surgery, like the one patient I showed you who never really needed it. Yes, she has spasms. Yes, she gets her injections every three months, but she's managed without surgery. So that's a better option for some people. Okay. Um, yeah, one thing I'd like to add to that is that you said your, your injections work for about one and a half months. The BEVRF has put together a packet of information that you can share with your insurance company, whether it's uh, insurance or Medicare and a supplement that will uh, allow you to get your injections more frequently. So if you just contact me for that, I can send you that information um, so that you, your doctor can file an appeal. Right. I don't That's know. What, good to know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, tell your patients. So do you do unilateral myectomy? Um, yes, I have. Sometimes we do that for patients with 
uh, hemifacial spasm. And as you know, some patients have a benign essential blepharospasm both eyes, but one eye is worse than the other. So we may do a myectomy a little more aggressively on one side than the other. Okay. Uh, what are the side effects of the frontalis sling? I mentioned a couple earlier, but we always worry about extrusion. So the sling can come through the skin above the brow. Sometimes just the wound breaks and, it, and it's an inlet to an infection. So if there's an extruded sling, we like to try to take care of that right away. Of course, the sling can be too tight. The sling can be asymmetric. Like you saw the couple that I showed, they're not perfectly symmetrical. It's very hard to get those even. They may look even on the table, but after they go heal and the lidocaine wears away, they may be a little asymmetric. Um, and then of course, lag up thalamus, you know, it could, your eyes could be dry and it, you know, it's hard to get a perfect balance with the slings. We, we aim to correct it to about mid pupil when we put it in. Um, but when all the lidocaine wears off and the anesthesia wears off, it may look different. So, so infection is the biggest one. Dry eye is probably the next. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this lady asks, my eyes can open, not droopy, but a lot of involuntary blinking. Should I then consider a limited myectomy versus a full myectomy? And maybe you can just address wh when you should do one or the other. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I really don't like the full myectomies just in my hands. People are satisfied with a partial myectomy and I prefer not to put scars above the eyebrows unless somebody's really got a severe, severe brow spasm. And usually I think men have thicker muscle mass in their brows, so they may be a little bit better candidate to have a full myectomy and probably women are a little bit better for a partial myectomy, but most of the cases I do are just partial because that's where the blink power is coming from, is coming more from the eyelids than the brow. And like I said, it can leave some unsightly scars. Now there's ways to reach some of those muscles through the eyelid incision, but it, you can also hit some of the nerves that could cause some numbness on the forehead. Not that that's the end of the world, um, but it's, it's just another way to approach it. Okay. Uh, what's your view on how often it is safe to, to do Botox injections? Yeah, I, I always worry about the immunogenicity of toxins. There's, um, it's rare, but you know, the, the molecules are different with all the companies. So, you know, ONA is a big molecule, weighs 900 kilodaltons. Then you have the ABO, which is around 500 kilodaltons. And then you have the Zeeman or the, the INCO, which is uh, only 150. So it has the core. They're all made from the exact same strain, the Hall strain of bacteria, but they, in the little core of the 150 is the same in all of those products. Theoretically, you know, if you get too much toxin too frequently, you could develop antibodies and then nothing works. I have a patient I've, I've got videos of who was getting it for her migraine headaches for four years. And she was getting so much and her forehead had dropped her brow and she kind of looked masculine and was very unhappy with her appearance and the way it felt. So her doctor was telling her to go to a Medi spa to get cosmetic injections to lift her brow. And within two weeks of her getting all these injections for the migraines, she did that for four years straight. Now, the worst time to get an injection is two to four weeks after an injection, you know, that's, that's a booster shot. Like when you get your shingle shot, you get your second shot a month later. So basically she was getting booster shots for four years between the functional and the cosmetic, everything quit working. It quit working on wow. her migraine, it quit working on her wrinkles. The problem with testing it is years ago, we could get it tested in the United States to see if somebody had antibodies. Now it is exceedingly rare to have neutralizing antibodies where toxin just truly doesn't work anymore, but we see it. I've seen it in my clinic. A lot of doctors, if you talk to people will say, yes, we see that in our clinic. Now there's only two laboratories in the world that can do the antibody testing. One is in Germany and one is in Spain. And they're both proprietary owned by the neurotoxin companies. There's the, the, the company in the United States that tests for antibodies, uh, quit doing it. I called them on the phone asking to get antibodies for this patient. And they said, we don't have the reagents anymore. Well, the reagents are mice. They had to kill little mice to determine the antibodies. And then they, they changed it to a new test where they could sacrifice just one mouse, but they had to um, do a special test on the nerve to the liver. And so they're trying to improve that testing, but basically it's hard to prove the antibodies. And um, it's, it's so largely in the United States, we end up having to go by anecdotal stories. Okay. Has gabapentin um, ever been tried? Isn't it a neurological drug? 
Yes, uh, gabapentin's on the list of the multiple drugs that have been tried, Cymbalta and everything. And you know, if, if your physician has prescribed it, I think it's great to give it a try. I don't think any of the oral medications really you know, cure people. Every medicine seems to take the edge off. Okay, uh, let me see. This says, um, I have had Botox injections for four years, but they, never, they have never eliminated the blepharospasm. I tried Xeomin once, felt no improvement. What other drugs in order do you recommend for blepharospasm? I have Mage syndrome, vocal cords, and diaphragm are also spastic. Yeah, those, those are tough areas uh, to inject, obviously. So, I mean, I don't know how they're injecting just your periocular area, your eyelids. Um, some doctors are a little afraid to get too close to the eyelids. Could try another injector. Um, when you have diaphragm, I mean, I actually had one patient once whose spasms were so severe, she prolapsed her bladder. I have other patients that have such severe body dystonia. They have to carry around injectable Ativan with them. So you may need to have a, a treatment team of multiple kinds of physicians put together to come up with, you know, other, um, alternatives for you to have available. But as far as the, the eyelids, I just don't know if there's, um, I'm not sure if it's the actual toxin you're trying, or if maybe the, the injection pattern needs to be tweaked. It's just hard to totally answer that question without a proper evaluation. Um, did I hear correctly that Medicare does not cover the surgery either? That's correct. We have not been able to get paid for myectomies for years. And we used to put it in as, it's not a recognized code. We used to write letters of medical necessity and we could get payment on it, but it's just that for some reason it's gotten harder and harder. And we spent more time on the phone than it's even worth. So like I said, we bill for the blepharoplasty and the ptosis repair. At least I've personally given up. I don't know about other physicians. It's very hard to get paid, which is a shame because it's such a severe condition. I don't know what we can do to uh, get them to believe it's real. Okay, right. Uh, how many patients percentage-wise are on Ritalin? Do you even have any data? Um, I, I've never looked at my patient population to see how many uh people are on it. Um, I, I, it's over half of my patients. And like I said, I, I encourage them to use it sparingly and more when their toxin injections are wearing off. So I, and, and I give them the, the twice a day dose so they can have uh, one available for morning and night. But like I said, we try to prefer to only use it for the two or three weeks when their toxins wearing off. Um, some people really like the long acting. I, I don't like giving long acting. And then some patients that are wanting more and more, we actually end up turning over their prescriptions to um, either a family doctor or psychiatrist or somebody else, because I, I, I don't feel comfortable writing huge doses of those medications. Okay. Um, here's a patient who had a my partial myectomy in 2003, uh, a levator tendon shortening in uh, 2008, and that helps keep the eyes open, but now can't fully close the lids, so dry eye problems. Mm -hmm. um, this patient still needs Botox every 10 weeks or so. Do you have any suggestions how to deal with that? It's a really, it's a very tough balance. It's, it's a tough balance between getting the eyes open and letting them close. So, so sometimes there's just no easy answer, but definitely at night, uh, moisture chambers, humidifier, ointment in the eyes at night, I've got some patients who put a little bit of saran wrap or plastic wrap over their eyes before they go to bed. Um, but once, you know, I mean, you can surgically lower the lids back down in some patients. Uh, we hate to do that because then you can't fight the spasm and you can't see as well. Um, but of course, the, preventing the cornea from drying out is, is of utmost in, importance. Okay. Um, I'm just kind of scrolling through and, and I apologize if we, if we can't get to every single question, um, but we'll have a copy of these questions later and perhaps I can um, find some answers uh, or, or maybe Dr. Woodward, you could find some answers. What are your thoughts about Artane? I, I've heard some good things about it, but I'm, I'm not familiar enough. I've never tried it in my patients. So we okay. talked about it at the last medical board meeting, I think for a little while. And I, I think it'll be another thing that takes the edge off that there's some promise with it, but again, not a cure. I had a couple people on this uh, ask if you uh, are, know about or are using Upneak. Um, yeah, I've, I've just, it's a newer medication and um, I'm 
friends with the CEO of the company. They don't have a full force of reps yet to come around and teach the, you know, come around and explain to the products to us. Um, I've written it for a few patients that like it for smaller things like a little mild asymmetric ptosis and things like that. I don't know if it'd be a blepharospasm cure. The nice thing about the Upneak is it's basically it's Afrin nose spray. It's oxymetallazone. This is what you use. It's Afrin nose spray. And it's double the strength to the nose spray, except they formulate it in a way that has lubricants in it so it doesn't dry out the eyes. So in their studies, they showed that it didn't increase dry eyes because the thing that they worried about is if you make the eyes more open, they can become more dry. They studied it for about six weeks. And... Um, it, you know, it, it, it's nice. It lifts up the lid, maybe a millimeter. And, um, you know, that's, that's about what I know about it. I haven't tried it in a lot of my blepharospasm patients yet. I'd like to try it myself. Uh, <laughs> I a sample yet. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Woodward, for, for joining us and giving us this information today. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. I hope that this information helps somebody somewhere. And again, I have to thank uh, so many wonderful patients over the years. I think it helps more to hear their stories and see their results from surgery than it does to listen to me talk. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. It's been very informative, but thank you for joining us and have a rest of a beautiful day.